Hello everybody, welcome to episode 19 of the Brooklyn Knit Folk Podcast. My name is Jacqueline. You can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as at Jacqueline Salem. Show notes for this podcast can be found on the Brooklyn Knit Folk uh, group if you just search in the groups tabs on Ravelry. And I think that's all the intro info you need to know. This is a podcast about knitting, uh, sewing, crafting in general lifestyle. So if that sounds like it's up your alley, great. If not, I don't know why you're watching this. Sorry, this is a really weird introduction. Thanks to all new and returning viewers for coming back and joining me. And I want to give an extra warm welcome to Lori, who is Knitty Cactus. Deb, who is Deb Buckingham, R Winters 437, Akira, who is Kira Green 95, and Danielle, who is Knox Yarn Co. Thank you so much for introducing yourself in the Ravelry group or for sending me a private message to say hello. I really appreciate every interaction I have with everybody, so that's why I'm doing this. So hello to all of you, and thanks for saying hey. So we have a pretty diverse episode up today. Um, I do want to say that it is, if you haven't already heard, New York City is in the midst of a uh, heat wave and I've turned off the air conditioners just for you guys so that there would be no noise. So if that doesn't prove my love for you, I don't know what will because in the words of my super southern East Tennessee step, not step brother, uh, brother-in-law, it is hotter than a freshly fox in a forest fire, if I do say so myself. So we're gonna keep going through the heat and all the fibery things that are just gonna make me really hot and I hope you guys enjoy the episode. So let's jump right in with some finished objects because I do have one. It's not 100% finished because it's not been blocked yet, but the dotted rays. Am I holding this the right way? This is the front, no, this is the front. Oh my gosh, it is huge. It's way beyond my wingspan, and it's not even blocked yet. I can't imagine how big this thing is gonna be when it's, when it's finally blocked. I love it, I love all the colors, it's so fun, it is so soft, you guys. Every yarn in this is like luxury yarns, and it's, so cozy and squishy and soft and comfortable. I just, I cannot wait to use this in upcoming fall and winter. I love it so much. So let me go through the yarns real quick. This is the Dotted Rays, by the way, if I didn't say that. The Dotted Rays Shawl by Stephen West. I knit it on size US 5s. It calls for a 6, but I uh, my 6s were hostage on a different project, which I will show you in a minute. And my gauge has been pretty loose lately in general, so I think the fives were fine for this. I can't imagine how big this would have been if I knit it on the sixes. But here we go. Mocha by Yarn Yarn Co. The green is Ogre by Plucky Knitter, Primo Fingering. This gorgeous blush pink is of um, Sweet Sparrow Yarns by Julie. This purple color, oh, gorgeous, one of my favorites in the whole thing, is Fog by Yarn Yarn Co. This kind of beige color is Antique Lace by Madeline Tosh, Tosh Merino Light. I love singles for shawls. Can I just say that? I think I just love knitting with singles in general. They're so, so soft. This kind of speckly uh, navy black and white is a Koigu Painter's Palette Premium Ultimate uh, Ultimate Merino, something like that. You guys know what I'm talking about, the KPPPM. This gorgeous hand-dyed yarn is Cat Sandwich Fibers in the Mookite Jasper colorway. I built my entire color palette for this shawl around the Cat Sandwich Fibers. Oh, I love it so much. And then finally we have Tarte, which is a Madeline Tosh yarn. The Tarte is notorious for bleeding. So if you didn't already know that, Madeline Tosh yarns, especially her dark reds and dark blues, absolutely notorious for bleeding. So I knew that before I wanted to knit this in and before I block it that I was going to heat set it first. I am so glad that I did. I had so many of you reach out and tell me um, instructions for how to do that well. I had also suggestions for color catchers, which were I haven't tried, but that sounds great too for a future 
future use and knowledge but boy let me tell you when I heat set this it bled like crazy in the pot so I'm going to tell you how I heat set it these were instructions that Katrina from Cat's Kettle and the Yarn 30 podcast gave me so just in case you run into a similar issue you can know how to do it yourself so first you'll take the skein and um, make sure it's not caked I had I had mine already caked but I had to rewind it onto a skein and then you'll tie it in at least four different places. Put it into a pot filled with water. Um, I just put the water kind of a couple inches above where the yarn was just to make sure it kind of could be fully submerged. I let it sit in this uh, pot with the water for about 30 minutes. Then I turned on the heat and added a cup, uh, one cup of white vinegar to it and let it boil um, for about 30 minutes. So I set a timer I kept it on the heat for 30 minutes. After the 30 minutes, I had removed it from the heat and let it sit overnight in the pot so that it could absorb all of the dye that it possibly could. The next morning, took it out of the pot and rinsed it as well as I could. I kept rinsing and rinsing and rinsing and rinsing in just the bathtub until uh, there was no more red that I saw and then let it hang dry, which took about two days to dry the skein. It's been pretty humid here, so it's been like, it took forever, I felt, for it to dry and kind of had it in front of a fan. And then uh, re-caked it and knit with it. And even after that, even after all of that, while knitting with it, I still had red on my hands. I don't think, I, I can't really see any more because I've showered a couple times since then, but I had a picture of it. I'll insert a picture of it here. It's not that bad, but it's still bled. So I'm not too concerned about it because I think like it was so marginal that any dye that comes off is probably not going to be a night like you know too bad for the rest of this it's I'm not too worried about it but still even after all of that I just can't believe that Madeline Tosh has to know this is a problem like that company has to know like people talk about this all the time if I've even heard of it it's enough of a problem why don't they fix it you know it's just like we talk about this and we have to go through you know, four days of lost time knitting with that yarn before I could actually use it in this project to heat set it and dry time and, you know, etc. So I don't know why they don't fix it, but either way, I'm super happy with how it turned out. It's so cozy and soft and by far the largest shawl, maybe even the largest project in terms of yardage that I have knit so far. I did knit one color for two wedges and I ran out of the last color, the tart, to do a second wedge. I have like 30 some odd grams left so I wouldn't have had enough to do a second wedge so I stopped at the first wedge and bound off. I think it looks a little bit strange compared to the rest proportionally. I wish I had had enough to do that but you know it is what it is. I'm happy with it overall and I love the color palettes especially uh, I can't it's even hard to pick a favorite honestly too difficult to pick a favorite oh no this is the right side too difficult to pick a favorite I love them all but I have to say Yarn Yarn Co though was like a revelation for me to discover her yarns I just love and cat sandwich fibers of course which I've gone on about cat sandwich fibers yarn yarn Co. oh but even sweet sparrow yarns was so fun to knit with too I, was, I don't know I can't pick a favorite it was a total stash buster like I I'm looking at my stash up there right now it's like half of what it, not half that's extreme but it's like it totally used up a ton of stash yarn so this project is great if you want to use like little bits I did steal some from skein like full skeins like the sweet sparrow yarns and the plucky just because I really wanted to use the color palette with it but yeah total stash buster Ugh, it's so soft. I can't wait to wear this. I'm going to bring it to work, start using it immediately because right now that's where I use all my shawls. So I just need to block it first. I'll let you know how it goes post blocking with the tart. But like I said, as much as I, since I heat set it, I don't anticipate that being much of a problem. But it's huge. So huge. So that's my finished object for the week. I'm really excited about it. And I guess with that, we'll move into works in progress. So I said on the last episode with Katrina, which I hope you guys enjoyed that by the way, because we had so much fun doing that. Um, I said on the last episode that I was not allowed to cast on 
that pair of socks with that Druzy Rising yarn until I finished another project. And I did cast on under this pair of socks a couple days prior to finishing it because my whips are so big they will not fit into my purse anymore. And I have a pretty big purse, but as you can see this is like a giant, you know, project. So either way, I finished the shawl, it's all good. And so I cast on the socks. This is lifting in my cat's kettle Japanese knot style bag. This is my favorite, favorite bag out of all the bags I have. It's just, I will stuff a shawl in this until it will not fit anymore. And I honestly, even a tiny shawl would probably not really fit that well in here. But I just love the style of bag. I don't know what it is. It's just my favorite. So I want to kind of maybe pattern hack this and figure out how she made it so I can make a few for myself. Anyway, I've cast on the uh, pattern called Socks on a Plane by Laura Lindman, I think her name is. Yes, Laura Lindman. In the Druzy Rising yarn, in the taffy colorway. And this is her Silk Sock Singles base. It's 70% superwash merino and 30% silk and it's a single yarn. Honestly, singles are not the easiest to knit for these socks, but the color is just so, unless it's like a project like this, where you're like, the idea is to knit tons of crazy colors, it's not really my style, this color, to like wear this as a garment. So when I buy crazy color skeins like this, and like neutrals are my wheelhouse. So when I buy crazy color skeins like this, they're going to be used for socks most of the time. So, and it has the silk content in it, so I think it will be fine in terms of uh, wear and tear. So this is socks on a plane. And look at those speckles in there. Isn't it pretty? Oh, I love it. And look at this stitch marker on this other one. I don't know who sent me this, but isn't it the cutest? I'm covering it up. Sorry, I'm not doing a very good job of showing you this. It's just like a little fox. Isn't he cute? So, Socks on a Plane, Laura Lindman. It is going to be the most luxurious pair of socks I've ever worn. I mean, that's all there is to it. 2.25 millimeter US 1 size needles. I cast on 60 stitches. Socks on a Plane has a medium and a large size or small and medium for a 56 stitch count and a 64 stitch stitch count. But I've knit socks so far with a 64 stitch count and 56. 64 is too big. 56 feels good, but I just kind of want to test out a size in between just to make sure that I'm not you know, missing out on anything. Plus the cables will make the sock a little bit tighter. So if there was an opportune moment to test out a larger stitch count, I think that this pattern would be it. So, so far a joy to knit. I have a two by two rib here. This is my favorite rib. I was doing a one by one twisted rib a few socks ago and I just like the way that this looks and feels better honestly and it's a lot less work than one by one twisted rib. But I think the yarn is just working up beautifully as you would expect from Druzy Rising yarn. It flows between this kind of blue and pink and then has speckles of red and yellow in it. It's really fun. So that's my sock whip that I have on the needles. I feel like now that I know how to knit socks, it's definitely become one of those things. I always have to have one pair of socks and needles at all times. It's just such a portable project. So everything that you've heard about socks is true. If you're not already knitting socks, of course. So yes, loving that project. And then treasure, you guys treasure. So as you know, I was at home visiting my nephew and every time I go home, um, I bring up stuff back up here with me to New York City that's been at my parents' house. So I just kind of bring it little by little rather than shipping a bunch of it up here to me at one time. And I was going through some of my sewing stuff because, oh man, has the sewing bug got me right now. It's like, it's always had me, but I'm talking more about garment sewing specifically, although this isn't garment stuff that I'm going to show you, but 
I did find in some fabric stuff that I got from my grandmother when she cleaned out her sewing stash because she's she and my grandpa are living with my aunt right now and I found the beginnings of another quilt. I am so excited. So I'm the only grandchild that sews really like or quilts I guess I should say. Um, so I'm thrilled to have this but it's kind of a mystery project because I have little to no instructions. This is what I'll show you what I've, I'm about to show you everything in here but little to no instructions. The only thing I have in here is a pamphlet about the Arizona Quilters Guild. Useless. Um, helpful hints for figuring yardage, which I guess I can use in a future project, but useless for figuring out what a, this is supposed to be. Um, these are the only notes I have about what the quilt is supposed to be. It's basically, it, it's, I wouldn't say it's useless, I just have to really analyze what she's doing here. It's very, very vague. Clearly, my mamma knew what she was doing with this, but I have no idea. And a receipt from the city of Mesa. I'm from Arizona, by the way. We all used to live in Arizona before I lived in Nashville. And a receipt for a city of Mesa beginning strip piece quilting receipt. The class was $50, by the way, which pff, I wish. Anyway, so the first part is pretty straightforward. We have blocks, two fabrics, and a second color, blocks with two fabrics. So easy enough to understand that situation. But then there are a ton of these rectangles in here, just this one color. And then these pieced rectangles made from bias strips. There are two sizes, this bigger size and the smaller size. The bigger size is the same size as these. So I know that these go together. And these colors are definitely my grandmother's color palette. There she's very desert Southwest colors in all of her quilts. So I know that these go together, even though this one seems like it may not go with this. Like I, I know this is, she meant for this to be this way. Plus this blue in this bias tape strip piecing here. So I have these two triangles, tons of these kind of reddish ones, and then not so many of these, guessing because they probably take forever to put together. And a whole bundle of these strips, which this honestly looks kind of like a nightmare to me. After that two, two inch square quilt, I'm just like ready to say bye bye to quilts that take forever. So this one will probably be a very slow work in progress, but anyway, so triangles. These multicolored triangles and then one, just one, sewn into a block, which is not the same size as this one. So we have these triangles that were sewn into these blocks but they're not the same size as the other blocks they were meant to go with. So this is what's throwing me off. If this one's going to be sewn into like a star pattern with these like around it, maybe? I have no clue. No clue. I do know that I'm supposed to sew the strips into these links and then cut them into the rectangles. That part is clear enough. But once they're in the rectangles, I don't exactly know what she had planned. And there's no chance of her remembering, honestly. So, yeah, it's really exciting. I might be able to figure it out from this like maybe quarter page of instructions. I sort of doubt it. Otherwise, I think I might just be like winging it and making it up based on the stuff she has in here. Either way, this is treasure. I'm really excited about it. Like I've said before in previous episodes that quilts, this is like real heirloom. It's like a project that I feel is the culmination of everybody's skill sets. The fact even that she's started this and knew what she was going to do with it, but now I have no idea. So I have to like make something of these things. I think it's really exciting. So I am really looking forward to kind of looking for patterns. First, I'll try to attempt to figure out what pattern she was going to use. 
Um, but if I can't figure that out, then I'll just kind of use these pieces in a way that I think will look cool together. So I'm really pumped about this. Not so pumped about this, honestly. I wish they were already all sewn together and then all I would have to do is cut them out. Yeah, this is like time consuming craziness right there. Time consuming is okay though, it's, it's fine. It's just like after all that piecing, after doing my two inch square quilt, like I said, is just not the project I'm in the mood for right now. Not super intricate quilting work at the moment. So that's that, really excited about that. The next work in progress, you guys, it's back! The Exploration Station. And as you may have seen, I have knit the brioche! Look at this. Look at this! It's done. The brioche section is done. So all I have now are just the three sections following it, which seem pretty straightforward. I just... I'm so thrilled, and thank you so much to Katrina for teaching me how to do this. It was... You know, it's, you always say, like, once you're finished learning something, like, I can't believe it took me so long to figure this out. But it was, it was really tricky, I think. But now that I know how to do it, man, I totally understand why people want to knit brioche so much. It is so squishy. To me, the payoff of it is totally worth it. You knit each row twice in case you've never knit brioche, so it is a little time consuming. But man, oh man, to me, I think it's totally, totally worth it. Let me kind of give you a rundown of the yarns I'm using once again. We've got Hearth, which is a skeiny dipping yarn. Venus Flytrap, wool and vine yarns. Urchin, hedgehog fibers, which one of my parents' cats got to this one, which is why it looks like crap. And Succulents, another wool and vine yarns. And it's kind of like, I call it my Pacific Northwest inspired exploration station. I just love the color palette. I'm obsessed with it. So yay, brioche is done. Heading on to the next section. I think it's called Sassy Slips or something like that. Leave it to Stephen West to come up with these super cool names like that. Bountiful Brioche, Sassy Slips. I can't remember the rest of them. But I'm just thrilled to have finally learned the brioche. And that brings me to arguably the most important topic that I'm going to discuss on today's podcast. And I don't really have a name for this topic. It's just kind of, it is what it is. This week I watched a podcast and I don't want to mention anything in particular because I don't want to out this podcaster, but she talks about something that I think a lot of people go through. In fact, I've had a similar, almost exact same conversation with two other people in the past month. And it's on the subject of not doing something because you think that other people are doing it better and you're not adding anything to the conversation or it's a saturated market or there's no reason why you should do it because somebody else is already doing it and doing it better. To me, that is like such dangerous thinking and so awful and sad. Like, I wrote some notes down here, so I'm going to refer to it because I'm like getting kind of, I guess, nervous and emotional like talking to you guys about it. But I just kind of wanted to respond to it because I feel like it's something that a lot of people go through that you don't want to start something or try something because you know other people are out there and they're doing it and they are doing it better. But I get so many comments to me about how I'm so fearless with my knitting and my projects and I know that those comments come from a good place but to me they're just completely untrue. Like how can you expect to learn anything at all if you don't even give it a try, you know? like. Why are you not worthy? Why are you not, why not you? Everybody has to start somewhere. And the people who are truly ace at this sewing or truly ace at brioche, they didn't know how to do it at first until somebody else taught them how. It took me 
four months, I calculated because I looked when I started my exploration station project page, four months to learn how to do brioche. It sat down for a while, you know, took it in a time out and I never gave up on it though. I never thought like, oh, I'm not gonna, not gonna do this. It's just that I needed to set myself up for success and use tools to, you know, like my friends or, you know, watching somebody do it in person, things that I know work for me to finally learn how to do it. Basically all this to say, I really hope that you guys won't let other people's success stop you from at least having a go or making, or, you know, making a try for something. You know, I feel like there are always going to be a bunch of people who are better than you. That's never going to go away. There's always going to be someone who's a better designer than me. There's always going to be someone who's a better knitter than me. There's always going to be someone who's a better sewer than me. It's just like, I think the only person you should be comparing yourself to is yourself and the project that you made last. Like if you're making progress on things that you're doing, that's progress. That's all that matters. Comparison to other people especially is absolutely the thief of joy. You can, you can do it. <laughs> this sounds so, I don't know, this sounds maybe like, not preachy, but like self helpy and you know maybe a little lame to some but I just think that everybody has to start somewhere just keep going why not you if you want to dye yarn dye yarn if you want to eat healthy you can eat healthy and any of the naysayers a lot of times I feel like they're just jealous or yeah just jealous that you're trying something new or that you're trying to make something it's just don't listen to those people and don't listen to that inner voice that tells you that you can't do it the only reason why you're going to fail at anything is if you don't try or you stop i mean for me personally failure is just like failure in the sense that something doesn't work out is going to be a given like, the first time you try anything, I'm going into it expecting it not to be perfect, but I'll get better at it eventually, as will you. Yeah. So I guess that's what I wanted to say, is that I just hope that you will not let fear and other people's success stop you from trying something. No one no one was perfect at anything the first time they tried it. Well, I mean, I guess a lot of people are perfect. But you know, you know what I'm saying. It's like everybody has to start somewhere. Why not you? And then the second bit of advice that goes with that is set yourself up for your own success. For example, I am never going to buy a book that teaches me how to do things. I'm not good at learning things by reading. I have to watch it. So YouTube is great. Or in the case of Katrina teaching me brioche, I have to see it in order to understand it. Reading from a book, it's not going to happen. So I'm not going to waste my time or my resources, my money on buying books to help me learn something. Same with like healthy eating, for example. Like this can go for, for really anything. It's just like if I buy the ice cream and put it in the fridge, I'm going to eat the ice cream. If I don't buy it, then I won't. Set yourself up for success know yourself, know your limitations, know how to get the most out of what you're trying to do. Anyway, hope that was helpful. It's just the thing I would say to you with all my heart is please don't, please don't give up or let other people dictate your own success and your own dreams. And with that, acquisitions. So as Laura of the Fawn Knits said on her last episode, I have been on a bit of an acquisitions bender. And I'll start with the yarn in no, no particular order. The last month I have just, oh God, okay. It was all necessary. First one. Nomadic Yarns, my first one. 
This is the Lupin colorway. I debated forever between this or uh, the Trelawney colorway. And wouldn't you know, uh, Jilly from the Knitting Broomstick podcast, she bought the Trelawney yarn. So it was like I got to like knit it through her, experience it through her. So I got this one. This is her trusty sock base, 75% superwash merino, 25% nylon. The Lupin colorway, self-striping yarns. If you haven't checked out her yarn before, her colorways are amazing. This is a Harry Potter one. It has like this little Deathly Hallows stitch marker. Navy, grays, and golds. I'm super pumped to knit with this. The next one. I just like to browse Etsy, you know, for shops I haven't heard of to find cool stuff. We Chickadee Woolery. Nature inspired woolly delights handmade with love. I saw this colorway, it's called Misty Mountains, and I just knew that this would be perfect for October. I just want to knit this in October. So pretty. So pretty. It's like this lilac with dark purples and browns and blues. There's even some flecks of red. Oh, it's just so dimensional. So pretty. Okay, Jafar, will you stop? Yeah. Digging in my stuff. The next one, which looks like janky as hell because I unskeined it to take a cool pic of it, but quite possibly one of my favorite skeins that I've ever purchased ever. I'll just take this off because obviously it's not adding anything to it now. Stacy from the Stress Knits has started dyeing yarn. And hell yes, girlfriend, because this is gorgeous. I really admire dyers who show restraint with skeins like this. Molly from a homespun house also has quite a few like the if you're a bird I'm a bird where it's just like a very neutral background super super subtle has these pinks and blues and some very tasteful speckles. This skein is called The Bell Jar, too, which doesn't hurt because I love that book. Gorgeous. So, sorry for messing up this skein when I'm showing it on the podcast, Stacey, but it had to be done. Did it for the gram, you know, as they say. So that's the next one. And the last one, that's three dyers. This is four. Fourth dyer. This is a lot for me. The wool barn. Oh my gosh. Another bucket list yarn. This is Barley on her luxury sock. So, so stunning. And this one is called Steel. It's the Silky Singles. This is not really my color per se, but I got this to knit as a gift for a friend who is a UNC Tar Heels fan. So this color was pretty close to that so I'm gonna knit her a shawl. She and I work together and she steals my shawls all the time in the office so I figured I'd just knit her one. She uses it all the time so I find that to be pretty knit worthy. So another wool barn. So I can't wait. So if I'm gonna knit with a color that's not like my number one fave it's gonna be awesome yarn. So I'm super pumped to knit with these skeins from the wool barn. These are not gonna go together. Um, I just saw this too and I was like well might as well get some for myself. So yeah. And then the last one, my camera is sitting on it right now. So I'm going to move you for a second. So just a warning. Hope this doesn't make anyone really sick. But, and excuse my really messy table. One moment. Look at this. It's a serger. 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 I got it on a stoop sale for a hundred bucks. These things are like $200 on Amazon. So I was like super, super pumped. Couldn't believe it. Really, really excited. So that's my last acquisition. Oh, it's not. Just kidding. Patterns. So as I said, I've been really, really, really into sewing lately. I want to make some garments. By the by, I've been sewing since I was eight years old on a machine and even longer than that by hand. 
I have never sewn a zipper in my life. So if that just goes to show you that like don't let other people's success stop you like I'm gonna sew that zipper if I when I had show when, whenever I show you guys a garment that has a zipper in it you would have never even known you know so you just gotta go for it anyway pattern number one mostly I got this because of the back look at that back the straight one and this like triangle cutouts one Kind of shows it easier right there. This is a Berta pattern, Berta Young 7232. Love the bodice on this. Next one is for a wrap dress because who doesn't need wrap dresses? This is Butterick B6054. And last but not least, apparently this is a really popular one. I had no idea. I saw Katie when she showed her dress. And then Kristen recently put out a podcast saying that she bought the pattern, and lo and behold, I also bought the pattern. This is Gertie for, um, Patterns by Gertie for Butterick. And this is pattern B5882. Look how cute that is. Granted, I probably wouldn't use that fabric, but the top of that is so cool. This has boning in it too, which should be fun to try out. So those are the patterns I got. I have so many on my list for my birthday. My birthday's coming up in less than a month. And basically for my family, I just told them, buy me patterns. Okay, got cut off by the battery on my other camera. So I'm going to finish recording this from my computer in my room. Um, I was talking about patterns and how I'm really excited about sewing right now. And all the patterns, like all my birthday list right now is just patterns from indie designers like Sew Over It and Deer and Doe and oh, I'm obsessed with the bras that uh, Maria from Stitched in Sweden is making right now. Oh, they're so pretty. So now I really want to get into bra making. I'm in a craftsy rabbit hole where I'm just like researching classes I want to take, which by the by, in case you guys didn't know, Craftsy has a subscription service for the month of October. So you can sign up for a fee and take as many classes as you want for the month of October. So I think I'm definitely going to do that to give it a try. So if you have any recommendations for craftsy, cra craftsy classes that you love, please let me know either in the comments below or the Ravelry group or wherever. So dying to do that. Also natural dyeing. I have got it in my head that I want to make a quilt from naturally dyed fabrics. And of course, as someone who lives in New York City, I probably picked the exact worst place that I could possibly be to do any kind of natural dyeing, considering I'm not around a whole lot of nature here. Oh, Kitty's gonna come say hello. Say hi, Mika. She loves it. Anyway, natural dyeing. So, to practice, I've just been kind of grabbing, my roommate gave me some white sheets, I had a white sheet, just saving up these white sheets to practice with, you know? So that's what I'm going to do with those, and maybe I'll even use them if the dye experiments turn out well. There's a book by Rebecca Desnos, it's only an ebook right now, but I know she's planning on making it a paper book soon. I'll leave it in the show notes it looks it's like it's amazing it's such a great resource and of course I've also looked at Wild Color by Jenny Dean and a few others like the Modern Natural Dyer and all those Jenny from Tiny Paper Foxes gave me some recommendations from ones to look at so I'm really excited to check that out and um oh one last little thing because I have it sitting next to me Stacy from Stress Knits when she sent me her uh the yarn that I ordered she sent me these gorgeous mini skeins. So my colors. So my colors. Look at these. Beautiful. So thank you so much for that, Stacy. And with that, I think that's... Hi, Mika. I think that's the end of the episode for today. I hope you guys are having a really great couple of weeks. Um, I certainly have been trying to get my life back on a more regular schedule. I've been attempting to go to bed at 10.30 every night, which may sound really late to some of you, but I used to, used to as in like a week ago, would go to bed at like 1 or 2 until I would just stay up until I got tired. So 
now I'm like forcing myself in bed by 10, lights out by 1030. And it has made such a difference to my days. I'm, I'm a believer. So now I have more time to myself in the morning. I've been getting up earlier, been watching podcasts and knitting and just doing all these things that I would want to do otherwise, but just would be, I'm a morning person as it is. So anyway, just wanted to say that. So if you're thinking about giving it a shot earlier bedtime, maybe give it a go. <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, I love you guys. I will talk to you soon. Follow me on Instagram for more stuff if you're interested. Like this video if you liked it and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. Bye. Mwah.